All right, we are at 45 speakers um, right now and at 302, so I would like to get started. Um, so first of all, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar on Green Fair and Resilient Recovery. My name is Christina Klimovich, and I'm a head of advisory and consulting at GME Finance, and I'll be your host and moderator for today. Today, our goal is to stimulate a discussion about the important role of sustainable home renovation can play in stimulating a green and fair recovery post-COVID-19. So we'll address a number of elements, including opportunities and challenges and key principles for designing and promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy renovations, primarily focusing on the residential sector. I should note that this webinar is organized under the umbrella of Europace, and Europace is a Horizon 2020 funded project designed to make sustainable home renovations simpler, more affordable and reliable for all Europeans. And we do that by combining affordable financing with people-centric technical assistance. The financing innovation there is inspired by the US ACE model where the debt is specifically linked to property and not an individual. The Europace project aims to stimulate a massive increase in the number of home renovations. And at the moment, we've launched a program in Catalonia that's now open for business and has already mobilized more than 1 million in home renovations. And the model is now being adapted in Portugal and Belgium. Um, a couple of words about housekeeping today. Um, the webinar will last about one hour. And uh, we have nearly 200 people registered, um, hopefully more joining as uh, the time goes by. And uh, we have four speakers from the International Energy Agency, um, Renovate Europe campaign, um, European Investment Bank, and Climate Bonds Initiative. We'll start with a few remarks from the speakers, and then we'll jump into a discussion. And lastly, we'll address the questions from the audience. So um, here's a note for the audience, uh, please, um, and add your questions to the Q&A box down at the bottom um, in Zoom, um, and we'll address them um, during the webinar. And uh, now I would like to invite our speakers to make a short introduction and share one key message about the role of home renovation in the post-COVID recovery. Um, first of all, we'll start with the International Energy Agency. Um, the International Energy Agency has been an active voice in these past few months advocating for green recovery and the ambitious use of the stimulus funds. Today, Kathleen Gaffney is with us to speak on some of these points. Kathleen, I will be sharing my screen to show to get your slides. Thank you, Christina, um, and uh, thanks for having me and uh, welcome. I'm glad to be here and hoping everybody is doing well and recovering uh, according to the rules where you are. In Paris, where I am, it's, it's quite a different day today and yesterday than it has been, so we're happy about that, um, while the sun's still shining anyway. Um, so yeah, I guess I had a few slides to share. I'm not seeing them now, I'm just seeing the main um, slide from the, there we go. So yeah, I just wanted to set the scene. I know we're supposed to talk today about the renovation market, in particular residential renovations. Um, but I'll just set the scene with some of the global trends and, um, and then leave it to the other speakers to get into more of the details of the webinar. So I just wanted to share this one first view of the world in lockdown. So what you see here is uh, as a result of the measures to mitigate and spread, uh, mitigate the spread of the uh, COVID-19 virus, um, some, something on the order of over 4 billion people have been subject to a complete or partial lockdown uh, by the end of April, and that uh, correlated to about more than 50% of global energy use being affected by the various containment measures. So this impact on global energy demand, as well as CO2 emissions, has, is basically unprecedented in both the speed with which it has transpired, but also the depth of the decline. And governments have been looking to the IEA to provide data and analysis to navigate during this crisis and also plan for the recoveries. So um, next slide, please. So what you see here is, a, is the uh, effect of various lockdown measures, uh, has, uh, what it has had on uh, reducing electricity demand. And this graph present, uh, presents some of the results for some countries where we've seen daily, the daily data for electricity demand. Um, and it, it varies based on uh, the duration and the stringency of the various lockdowns. But after correcting for weather, 
the full lockdown, lockdowns that we've seen in various European countries like France, Italy, Spain, and the UK, those full lockdowns have resulted in reduced daily electricity demand of about 15, or at least 15%. Um, and we're also seeing changes both to how and when electricity is used during the lockdowns. And therefore we're seeing the shape of the electricity demand changing over the course of, of the day. Next slide, please. And, what, and, and this is a, a very um, compelling slide just to show the, the, uh, the large, that we're, so what we're seeing here is the sort of largest decline since the Great Depression in terms of electricity demand. And it's going to be eight times the reduction that we saw uh, in response to the global uh, financial crisis. And in particular, Europe is set to feel the largest impact because of the reliance on service sectors, uh, service sectors playing a, a large role in their economy. So electricity demand is on track to fall by about 5% in Europe, uh, globally uh, in 2020. Next slide. And also we're seeing that global CO2 emissions are expected to drop by about 30 gigatons in 2020 which is almost 8% lower than in 2019. And this would be the lowest level that we've seen since 2010. And the decline would be the largest ever, something on the order of six times larger than the previous record reduction um, in 20, uh, 2009. Um, and what, what, uh, what's behind this graph, you see the US would undergo the largest absolute, absolute decline, but China and uh, the European Union basically not far behind. Slide six, please, for the next slide, thank you. Uh, but uh, despite these substantial reductions, um, in order to maintain on the pathway for a, a sustainable development, it calls, for a uh, it calls for continuous efforts and commitment. Otherwise, these results are just going to be temporary and we're likely to see rebounds in the coming months. And governments can play a major role in shaping this, uh, shaping this recovery. Um, in particular through uh, economic stimulus packages, which we're going to talk about today. But, but this graph here shows the sharp pickup or the sharp, the magnitude of the opportunity that energy efficiency can play, has, the role that energy efficiency can play uh, in bringing the world towards the sustainable development scenario outcomes. And with, with uh, most of the energy efficiency opportunities being generally cost effective, there remains considerable barriers to the uptake of energy efficiency, such as access to finance or a lack of information. A lot of the topics we'll be talking about today. Next slide, please. And in, in the building sector, this is really important, not only because um, we've seen investment in, in energy efficiency sort of uh, stall in recent years, but it's likely to fall in, the, in response to the, the containment measures, and then uh, we're also already seeing that energy efficiency investments are not tracking anywhere near uh, at the level of other investments in construction. So we're, 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 we're starting from a sort of uh, bad spot to come back from this, these trends, and the stimulus efforts that governments are um, considering will really play an important role in, re in, in reversing these trends, or at least in terms of supporting um, higher levels of investment in the building sector in particular. So just to, um, just to leave it there, because I think, like I said, the next speakers are gonna talk more about some of the specifics of the stimulus packages in the past have been able to achieve and what we need to do going forward. So I'll leave it there and happy to take questions uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Really appreciate it. And now I'd like to hand it over to Prashant Vazey from Climate Bonds Initiative. And uh, before that, I also would like to note that Prashant, together with his colleagues, developed a discussion paper for this webinar. The discussion paper can be found on the Climate Bonds Initiative website under the Reports tab. And uh, it delves a bit deeper into the elements of the successful stimulus packages and uh, based on the 20, 2008 uh, financial crisis as well. Prashant, over to you. Thanks, Christina, for the intro. That's uh, really grateful for that. Um, as Christina mentioned, I work at uh, Climate Bonds Initiative and I head up the policy work here. Um, for, we're not quite as well known as the IEA, so just to, by way of explanation, Climate Bonds Initiative is a, a not-for-profit that specializes in green finance. 
we're probably best known for developing the climate bond standard. And what this does is it certifies assets that are compatible with the Paris Agreement. And this includes not just renewables, but also new buildings and also energy efficiency retrofits. And uh, we're particularly proud to be members of the Europace Consortium, that Christina talked about earlier. And um, as I think uh, she mentioned, uh, the purpose of this consortium is to develop and, and trial novel ways of financing deep retrofits. So retrofitting existing homes it's always been um, the orphan of climate mitigation policy. We all know that homes account for something like 27% of final energy consumption. And it's possible through deep retrofit to reduce emissions from homes by as much as 80%. And yet the rate of retrofits is something like 1% a year and only about 0.2% of this is deep retrofits of the kind of magnitude needed to really make a dent. Um, COVID has meant there's been a real slowdown in the economy. I think Kathleen's already suggested how this is impacting on global emissions, but the real kind of economic consequence of this is the loss of jobs. Estimates are saying that as much as, much as 6 million jobs will be lost in Europe as a result of the COVID crisis. And it's a real opportunity now. In fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really um, an obligation on us now to think about what government actions can be taken to develop this, um, rectify this kind of uh, huge recession that uh, awaits us in front of us. So what I'm gonna be doing with my two slides, and there are only two, is talking a little bit about um, how energy efficiency squares up in terms of this effort now to kickstart the economy and, and, and see a recovery. What I've done with this slide is just show the kind of programs that stimulus packages might want to target in order to grow jobs. And where we've got to at the moment in the kind of current COVID crisis is really emergency measures, lockdowns, uh, wage subsidies, which are there to stop households and small businesses going under. What we need to do over the, the, the next year, two years, even three years, is this build back better, this kind of uh, campaign that we hear ahead of us. Now, this is, this is just some of the kind of um, indication of the kind of things that the sectors that might be promoted uh, through this. As I mentioned, something like 6 million jobs are likely to be lost uh, through the coming recession. Um, what we need to do is, is, is target sectors that have spare capacity and be ready, can be mobilized readily quickly. Um, retrofits are particularly suitable to this because um, a lot of the kind of programs are already there and uh, they are utilizing um, unemployed um, construction workers. And um, the estimates are something like um, a million, uh, uh, six million uh, construction workers could, could uh, be losing their jobs over the uh, coming time. It's also important that uh, we try to provide social benefits and um, with, with the retrofit programs. And the advantage of um, uh, energy efficiency retrofit is it alleviates fuel poverty and it also improves the livability of homes. And if you're like me, I'm spending many, many, many more hours than I expect to in my home. And I'm sure many of us do. Um, it's also important as an economist uh, speaking here uh, that there are multiplier effects. Uh, uh, the, the expenditure by government is actually manifest through um, increasing consumption by uh, households of receiving it. And this kind of uh, goes through the economy um, over and over. The multiplier effects from previous uh, um, spending programs, we, we found that infrastructure has got multiplier effects of something like 0.5 to 1.8, whereas things like tax cuts are much more modest than this, you know, 0.3 to 0.6. So there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a substantial kind of local linkage and local kind of jobs multiplier effect through construction and through infrastructure more generally. Um, let's just spend a little bit of time thinking about um, you know, you, whilst we must recognise the, the, the terrible tragedy just now and the tragedy that so many of us are facing, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic does provide an opportunity to address some of these chronic problems of small-scale uh, retrofit pilots, which have been done many, many times over uh, in, across the EU. And we're using this opportunity now to develop a, an entire programme that will help uh, economic recovery and also kickstart the retrofit industry so we can deliver at scale uh, quickly to make, uh, help the economy pull out of recession. 
And it's important we do this safely as well. So the construction industry, especially when it's outdoors, is particularly well suited to creating um, those kind of jobs which can be done safely outdoors. Um, the good news is really that we have experience to draw upon from 12 years ago following the 2008 financial crisis. Um, a number of countries, South Korea, USA, Europe and China, all created economic stimuli programs uh, in which to a varying degree there was expenditure on, on, um, on uh, climate mitigation and energy efficiency retrofit was a part of this alongside um, low carbon transport and um, uh, energy efficiency in industry. In terms of size, the USA and China had the largest absolute programs of about 800 billion and 600 billion respectively. But of these, only about 12% of the US program was um, around um, green recovery. And this was the so-called ARA program. Um, in China, it was much more substantial than this, uh, more like a third. Um, Europe was actually a relatively modest um, green tinge to the program. Um, uh, you know, something, uh, quite a large part by the EU budget itself, but a lot of member states have much, much more modest ones. I think uh, the, the data I've seen has been suggesting about 17% was overall green. But the interesting one actually was South Korea, which was a program of about 36 billion. Uh, it, had, it was targeting nearly all of this, about 80% of this was green. Um, it was quite a long lived program. It persisted for about four years and about 20% of this was uh, for retrofit homes. And it aimed to create around a million jobs. And uh, not many of these programs have actually been evaluated, but you can see the kind of uh, the level of ambition of these programs. So, what do we learn from these uh, previous Green Deals? What, what can we sort of take away from it? Well, number one message is really that make the stimulus program long term. The US one lasted for a full 10 years, and um, the ARA program kicked off. Um, as, as I think uh, Katrine uh, mentioned, uh, Christine mentioned earlier on, um, the pace uh, from the west coast of America, for which Europe base is essentially a progenitor. Um, also, um, I, I was lucky enough to go and visit uh, some of the weatherization programs on the, on the east coast, where, again, substantial skills development, innovation, all these things took place because we, we did have a long-term 10-year kind of time horizon. Second number point is the size matters. Um, the bigger is the better in this case. If, you, if, you, if the focus is on jobs, it's important that we roll it out at size and um, think about the multiplier effects and make sure that we kind of uh, develop these local link linkages, local supply chains, all these kind of things. Um, the South Korean program, because of its magnitude and because of its focus, managed to at least set out to deliver about a million jobs. Think about where you need to be in the future is the third message. Um, quite a large part of the EU spending was for carbon capture and storage, which you know, sadly hasn't paid off. So make sure that the investment is in programs that you would like to see develop and be maintained in 2050 once um, you know, we're trying to decarbonize. And that perhaps means that we should sort of de-emphasize airline um, bailouts and maybe re-emphasize things like energy efficiency. Um, just going to the next slide now. Um, as part of the Europace program, uh, our work was really, part of our work was to look at some of the successful schemes uh, around Europe. I mean. As I think I mentioned earlier, there's been many, many examples of pilot schemes and um, more mature schemes that have been running and operating across Europe. Um, if we want to get deep retrofit to work, and by work I mean at scale, that, uh, uh, creating a whole industry that's going to be doing hundreds of thousands uh, per, per, per year in order, per country to make sure that we can um, you know, decarbonize the home stock, what do we need? Well, one of thing, the things that we're learning and we're trying to sort of implement through our Europace program is you need a trusted delivery agents. You need to aggregate demand so that in, instead of individual homeowners trying to go out and seek, uh, we're, we're, we're working uh, street by street through local authorities or through social housing uh, providers. Um, point number three is mass production works. Rather than having uh, solutions that are too bespoke, where it requires um, each house to be separately assessed, uh, uh, you know, lots and lots of effort going into individual costings and developing the kind of individual plan. Try to mass produce. Issue number four is incentivize ambition. Um, it's very easy to go into a home and try to go for the low hanging fruit and just stop there. And too often we do that. But if we, we try to hit the really kind of ambitious targets of 80% reduction from homes, if you want to get new technologies like ground source heat pumps in, it's really important that we develop um, a whole house approach that's going for all the opportunities, not just the low-hanging fruit. And the last thing I want to just uh, uh, reflect on, and it's particularly important now that we're sort of discussing this uh, sort of stimulus program, is 
government uh, intervention matters. And uh, some of the, the, the best programs that we've seen have, have sort of um, men, uh, merged together elements of grant funding and low interest loans. And it, it, some of the best ones, they've actually pitched the grants so that the more ambitious the program, uh, the, the more generous the grants. So here's some of, some of the take home messages we, we're seeing. The last um, crisis back in 2008, we wasted in a sense. We could have at that time used it to reorientate our economy. Let's not waste this one. That's my closing message, thank you. Thank you very much, Prashant. And uh, now we'll focus on the financing perspective. Um, and today, Isidora Tapia is with us from the European Investment Bank, and he'll shed light on what EIB is doing to boost the renovation wave in Europe. Isidora, I'll have your slides here. Thank you. Thank you very much, first, for the invitation, and thank you to, to, to everyone for, for, for attending the webinar. I wanted to start uh, with uh, very briefly with uh, three messages about how the, the pandemic, uh, how the COVID-19 uh, is affecting uh, or can affect uh, the, the uh, climate change uh, climate change policies. Uh, first, I would say uh, something that uh, has demonstrated the, the pandemic is how challenging uh, uh, stopping climate change is. Uh, Kathleen has shown some figures and we have seen how after freezing the economies, after having uh, around 4 billion people under lockdown measures, uh, CO2 emissions are expected to fall only by 8% this year. Uh, and total uh, global emissions will be back to uh, 2010 levels. So when we uh, talk about the, the targets, uh, about re reducing uh, CO2 emissions by 30, 40, or 50%, uh, we can see how difficult, how challenging this is, because of course, uh, we don't expect to do this by freezing the economy or by locking down the people in the, in the buildings. So it is important uh, first to, to keep in mind that something that we are seeing these days is how challenging the, the overall commitments are. The, the second thing, and I, don't, I wouldn't like to overplay the, the similar and to exaggerate the similarities between the pandemic and, the, and climate change. Now, there are even some people that say that the, the, the virus can be a result of climate change. I, I don't think there is any uh, scientific evidence about that, but there are some uh, similarities in uh, other respects. Uh, health is a public good as it is climate. Uh, and this shows uh, how important it is, the need for coordination at the global level. So we can only stop the virus, we can only stop the pandemic if we uh, act on a coordinated level. And this also shows why some countries, uh, there, there might be some incentives not to do enough and to wait other countries to, to, to do the, the work. Now, this is what we usually call the prisoner's dilemma in, in economics. Um, so in both cases, I think it's very important to, to keep in mind how a public good needs to be uh, defended and protected in a, in a coordinated way. And, and the third aspect that I would like to stress is how the pandemic is changing or could change the, the opportunity cost of climate change uh, policies. Um, and by this, I, I mean the, the following. Um, I mean, there is one very specific and, and, and actually has to do with the topic of the webinar today, and it's about buildings. Uh, we don't know what the future will be like. Uh, we don't know how the pandemic will change our behavior, uh, our economies, etc. What we know is that probably we will spend more time in our buildings. And this, of course, uh, means a massive opportunity for the renovation of existing buildings and for increasing the, the standards uh, of those buildings and the comfort of, uh, of, the, of, 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 of living in, in these buildings. But there is an, also an opportunity cost at an aggregate level. Um, the energy transition and stopping climate change means a massive uh, investment in the existing stock of the economy. And of course, there is an opportunity cost in doing this. First, that there is a value in the stock that uh, we already have. And uh, second, that the investment 
it has to uh, be done uh, very rapidly and taking into account the typical investment cycle of the companies or even of the of the governments. Uh, what will create the, the pandemic and the, the economic uh, slowdown that uh, has been associated, that has been a result of the pandemic, is the massive opportunity for investment. Uh, so there will be, in the coming years, a huge opportunity to increase the investment in the economies. And this is why it is the right moment to act in a, in a way that will help to, to stop climate change and to reduce the CO2 uh, uh, emissions of, of our uh, of our existing uh, production stock. Um, and now uh, I will uh, go back to the uh, to the European Investment Bank to the idea what we do, what we are doing, and how we think that this uh, will result in an increase of our activities in energy efficiency and, in particular, in energy efficiency in buildings in the coming years. Uh, First, I wanted to, to just highlight how our lending to energy efficiency has increased in the, in the last uh, five uh, to seven years. So as you can see here, energy efficiency actually has uh, become the largest energy subsector uh, supported by the IB. Uh, last year, we lent 4.6 billion to energy efficiency projects um, worldwide uh, with an increase of uh, four times uh, since 2012. You can go to the next slide, please. As uh, Kathleen, uh, Kathleen uh, pointed out, within the energy uh, efficiency sector, the largest uh, opportunity exists in the building sector. Building represents still 40% uh, of the CO2 emissions, uh, around 35% of the energy consumption, and this is why uh, most of the investments within the energy efficiency sector are still to be materialized in, in buildings. Industries, especially large uh, corporates, they have invested in the past in increasing the efficiency of the processes. There are still many opportunities in the uh, SME space uh, and also in public lighting, but in our view, buildings represent the largest potential and the largest untapped uh, subsector. And this is actually very, very much in line with the numbers of the, our past activity in the last uh, five years, where 70% uh, of our in investments, of our lending, uh, has uh, gone to, to the building subsector. In this context, uh, and in the context of the um, new EU regulation, the um, the recast of the energy performance of building directive and the revision of the uh, decarbonization scenarios of the EU. Uh, last year, in 2019, the uh, European Investment Bank approved a revision of its energy lending policy. It was approved in November of 2019, uh, increasing the, the ambition of the uh, climate change targets in the overall lending of the EIB and also incorporating into our activities some principles that are already embedded in the EU regulation, such as the energy, fir uh, energy efficiency first principle definition, which basically means that uh, energy efficiency has to be the, the first point of reference in, in energy project uh, within the energy sector that uh, we look at. If you go to next slide, please. Uh, within this context, of course, we have also participated in the discussion of the technical expert of sustainable finance uh, that was set up by the Commission in 2019 uh, with the aim of developing an EU-wide um, classification of environmental and sustainable uh, economic activities. Uh, this has been an, a very important exercise uh, that has uh, taking place in coordination with our energy lending policy. And now uh, I would say that there is a good uh, proposal, uh, which is still has to be incorporated into the legislation to, to have a common understanding of uh, what we define as uh, environmental and sustainable economic activities. Next slide, please. 
And I said, within this context, the new energy lending policy of the European Investment Bank uh, has a strong focus on, on energy efficiency, uh, and in particular by um, highlighting the importance of three uh, areas. First is the increase in the renovation rates of buildings. Second, the support to high levels of energy performance for new buildings. And third, the increase of energy efficiency investments by SMEs and industry. Uh, one of the most important measures in the energy lending policy is that uh, EIB can increase uh, its support to energy efficiency activities, going up to 75% of the eligible capital cost for this type of projects, uh, whereas for other projects, uh, this uh, limited limit is normally capped at uh, 50%. And in particular, in the area of uh, building renovation, the, the energy lending policy incorporates uh, an initiative, the EIBR, uh, with the aim of combining financing, TAs, guarantees, and other schemes that uh, are intended to support the renovation of existing buildings. Based on our experience, um, it is very important to combine the flexibility to support uh, the renovation of existing buildings, but also to combine the flexibility of the financial schemes with the support of TA. TA has uh, proven to, to, to be extremely important for the preparation of uh, building renovation projects for the preparation from a, from a technical point of view, but also from a financial uh, point of view. And uh, by doing this, we, we are able to support the promoters, but also the uh, financial institutions that are interested in uh, supporting the renovation of uh, existing buildings. Uh, TA uh, is technical assistance, sorry. <laughs> um, which is basically uh, a support, uh, grant support for the preparation of uh, new projects. Um, this was basically what I wanted to, 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 to say as an introduction, and of course, so ha happy to participate in the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Isidoro. Thank you for this overview. I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, on the various instruments that you described today. Um, now, I would like to turn it to Adrian Joyce um, from Renovate Europe. Adrian has been vocal about the need for concerted and also ambitious action when it comes to sustainable home renovation as part of the post-COVID recovery. So Adrian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Christina, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all of our global listeners. Uh, delighted to be here as a speaker this afternoon in Brussels. We were asked to present to you one key message about uh, energy renovation of the housing stock, and mine is multiple benefits will arise all across the board. So what I thought I would do is give you a sneak preview of a piece of work that we have commissioned from the Building Performance Institute Europe on what are the job creation potentials of investing in energy renovation of buildings and what are some of the um, economic, macroeconomic benefits that will arise. So they undertook a desk research for us on recent studies, uh, basically 2012 and younger, uh, identifying 35 studies uh, that they reviewed. In doing that work, they also looked at some of the building segments uh, because we are uh, of the opinion that addressing segment by segment can be a powerful tool to use to upscale uh, activity in the renovation sector in Europe. So the headline result of the work that they carried out is that on average, 18 jobs are created for every 1 million euro invested in energy renovation in buildings across Europe. Now, evidently that varies. And by digging into some country specific reports, we can tabulate uh, five countries uh, in, out of this study. In Croatia, 29 jobs are created per million, Italy, 15, Spain, 18, Estonia, 17, and Finland, 16. But you can see that the number of jobs created really uh, lands very close to that median or that average of 18 jobs for every 1 million. We strongly believe that this is a message of hope and a message that 
member states uh, will take up in order to overcome what Prashant talked about, that terrible loss of employment that has occurred during the COVID-19 crisis and the lockdowns across uh, many, many sectors, including the construction sector. But what I would like to suggest is that putting our money into home renovation and building renovation in general can not only safeguard all of the jobs in construction, but can absorb jobs from other sectors that will not be able to recover so quickly. So next slide, please. In the, uh, in the recent communication, in fact, in the staff working document that accompanied it, the next generation EU instrument, there was a very interesting table that identified what the commission sees as the investment gap per se sector. And the highest investment gap identified was for energy renovation of buildings and stands at 185 billion euros per year. For comparison, 120 billion for transport, 35 or 40 billion for renewables, just to give you an idea. So we're a factors above the other sectors. So our study shows that if fully mobilized, in other words, that 185 billion, then 3.3 million jobs would be create, created. And for me, that speaks to 3.3 million jobs on top of the jobs that exist uh, in the construction sector prior to the crisis. So the study goes on then to look at a couple of countries and uh, Spain comes out uh, as one that has produced a lot of research on this in recent years. And I found a really interesting uh, statistic that's been unearthed is that for Spain to create a job in the construction sector costs uh, the government around 14,000 euro. But to support one unemployed person from the construction sector costs them 20,000 euro. So each time they create a job in Spain, they save 6,000 euro off the top for their public finances. And then furthermore in Spain, for each one euro that they invest of public money, 62 cent is returned to public finances within one year, mainly through various taxation routes. Now, I'm not saying that the public finances are funding all of the research, but that money could be going to a guarantee fund, it could be going to a preferential loan scheme, it could be leveraging private investment, etc. But that money is returning uh, for each euro invested, 62 cent uh, per, uh, per in one year. And naturally, in the report, which we intend to launch next week, you will find the references back to all these studies. So my last slide then looks at uh, just a couple of points for three segments. Great benefits arise when you do a high quality renovation of your office buildings. Of course, that assuming we're going to be occupying office buildings in the future. So, uh, Studies show that on average, a uh, highly high quality energy renovated office building will boost productivity of the staff by about 12%. And this could be worth up to 50 billion annually to the economy. In hospitals, the same message, high quality renovated hospitals reduces the average stay of, your pa of patients by 11%, freeing up beds, allowing doctors to do more work more effectively. And when it's monetized, this could be worth up to 45 billion per year to the health sector. And then just in one country, some good reports in France show that poor quality homes are currently costing the government 930 million year per year in health uh, problems. So mold causing asthma, allergic rea reactions to dust in poorly ventilated buildings, etc. And the indirect cost in uh, this key report that was reviewed shows that the indirect to the economy could be as high as 20 billion per year through absenteeism, loss of productivity, etc. So my message this afternoon is uh, in designing the stimulus programs, we believe member states uh, and the European Union should be uh, earmarking or designing dedicated financing facilities and funds for the building renovation sector, not because we're saying they should do it, but because these multiple benefits arise and we can really kickstart the economy 
much more rapidly by this kind of wise investment. Delighted to take questions both from the audience, other panelists and the moderator uh, on any topic you like, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you for sharing and pulling together these impressive numbers, again, highlighting to um, us and to the audience as well how important it is to invest in home and building renovation. Uh, we'll actually stay with you, Adrian, for the first question, and then uh, um, I'll address some um, other questions as well. So in the past few days, we've seen a number of announcements of the next generation EU funds. Um, can you please speak to that? In your opinion, do they sufficiently focus on the renovation and also on the green recovery? Yeah, thank you, Christina. Indeed, uh, some very impressive numbers were announced last week by uh, President von der Leyen. And uh, no one can uh, say that the volume of money is not impressive and possibly the right kind of uh, amount. However, uh, that money has uh, a tag on it and that tag was put there by member states and it says, leave us the freedom and the flexibility to do what we want with this money. And there we find a weakness in what has been uh, launched last week. We in the Renovate Europe campaign had made a call for a dedicated renovation fund for all Europeans, a call that was supported by more than 125 organizations and companies from right across the segments from trade unions through industry to think tanks to city networks, etc., uh, into financial institutions. And it has been to date ignored. We're not giving up. We will keep working to have uh, a dedicated facility for building renovation. But in working on that uh, document, and maybe this is interesting for the audience, we've realized that in the building sector, there are three types of money that are needed if we're going to have the possibility of blending different types of money to be appropriate to the very varied uh, segments and col building cultures across Europe. And those types of money are number one, grants, or what I call giveaway money. Number two, guarantee funds. So that's funding that underwrites risk in order to leverage private investment. And number three is uh, loans, uh, loan money that is when you achieve a high performance in your uh, project, should have preferential conditions. And there are many different types of preferential conditions we don't need to go through. But having these three types of money and having the ability to blend between those types into a project or a program is for us a crucial factor that we don't see adequately covered yet. Now we see from Isidoro's uh, presentation that the EIB is already aware that blending grants and technical assistance and financing, which is kind of a sister description to what I've just put out, is really, really important. And we would fully agree with that. Uh, we find that technical assistance in our sector is crucially important and significantly underfunded, despite some excellent programs like ELENA, which is uh, managed, I think, by the EIB. So, a lot of work to do, Christina, to move this uh, forward to be sure that that money that's now at the right volume is wisely spent and spent for the best uh, for our futures and not spent uh, rashly on the wrong uh, sectors or segments of the economy. I'll stop here. Indeed, absolutely. Thank you so much, Adrian. And uh, at least at GNE Finance, we also supported your initiatives for the renovation yes. for all funds. Uh, which really um, we believe could help to move the needle and could help uh, do exactly what you noted as the uh, earmark and uh, uh, create this specifically dedicated fund um, for home renovation so it doesn't get lost uh, with other policies. Um, now I'd like to turn over to Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, thank you for sharing a number of uh, very interesting slides from the IEA. And uh, I know that uh, almost every week there are new posts and new reports coming out from uh, uh, the International Energy Agency. I would like to ask you to speak a bit more about the special report from the World Energy Outlook team that's coming out that will specifically highlight the impact of COVID. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So like you mentioned, there'll be a special report coming out in a few, in, yeah, just a few weeks, uh, highlighting the work that the World Energy Outlook has done to model the various uh, 
impact, potential impacts from various stimulus invest, investments across the whole energy sector. So, you know, if you had a trillion uh, euros or dollars to invest in stimulus globally, what, what would you get um, in terms of different impacts uh, if those investments were channel, channeled into various segments within the energy sector? So, I mean, I guess the big headline that I, we can say with confidence here, because it won't come as a surprise to anybody on the call, is that the energy efficiency as a sector um, contributes significant impacts in terms of jobs due large, in large part to the energy, uh, sorry, the labor intensity of the, of the energy efficiency um, measures themselves. So whether that's construction or in buildings, uh, residential, commercial, the whole, the whole range. So in addition to jobs, there's other, there are other impacts that the report will highlight. Um, and, it, and it also goes and does a pretty good job of um, illustrating what specific measures um, would be the best place to um, target some of those investments. So breaking down energy efficiency into buildings, transport, industry, you know, where, what would you get if you had, uh, if, you, if you implemented um, retrofit programs versus new construction programs or new vehicle uh, incentive programs versus um, other types of investment in industry, for example. So it, it does a decent job trying to dig a bit deeper into the, um, into the types of energy invest efficiency investments that would be worthwhile. But the IEA is following up this World Energy Outlook report with its own separate uh, articles and separate reports, and, and so are many of you on the, on the panel today, to show even more in more detail, not just why to make those investments and um, what they're likely to achieve, but basically how to, to design those programs so that they achieve uh, the maximum benefit, unlike, uh, like Prashant said, you know, let's not miss the opportunity like we did in 2009. Let's make sure we learn from those, um, those experiences to design the, the, the current stimulus uh, packages that focus on energy efficiency better. And we have put out uh, several articles on, on how to, uh, you know, how to learn from those examples. So if, you, if you're interested, I can send you some links or we can share them through the chat. But uh, yeah, th these are some of the, this is a key focus area of ours right now and will continue to be throughout the rest of the year. Another, another major report, which you'll see in a couple of weeks is um, coming out from the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency, which was uh, established sometime in the middle of last year and is about ready to, um, so it's made up of about 20 or so um, high level influencers in the energy sector, not just energy efficiency advocates necessarily, but people who have shown that they really know what it takes to get something done in the energy policy sector. So ministers, think tank leaders and such. These, this group of 23 commission members have put out a series of recommendations to generate the kind of urgent action that we need for energy efficiency. And obviously buildings and building finance plays a big role in that, in those recommendations. So this month you'll see both that report plus the report from the World Energy Outlook. And then finally, we'll bring it all together at our annual conference on the 23rd of June. So, um, so it's, really, it's really an important month for us to get all these messages sort of under one roof. And so I really appreciate the resources that have been shared today. And if we can add links, we'll be happy to follow up with them. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And we also um, very much following the IEA on both uh, Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, their daily posts and uh, very key messages are being shared. Um, um, yeah, every day and every week. Now I'd like to turn over to Prashant and to dig in a bit more into actually the um, impact of COVID on the energy efficiency financing industry and also on the whole renovation in both the short term and the long term. We kind of all talked about um, how it will change our way of life, how it will impact uh, you know, our mental state. There are lots of articles about it, but now I would like to specifically dig in of uh, what is you know, short-lived in your opinion and what will really stay with us and stay with this industry for the longer term. Over to you. Thanks. I'll try to keep this answer quite short because I'm conscious of all the different uh, ideas floating around. Um, 
just on the, on the kind of short-term effects, um, I think there's three things I'd like to highlight. One is the kind of effect in terms of scarring. I mean, um, at the moment, you know, we're, we're, we're going through a, a process where a lot of people are going to be losing their jobs. A lot of the SMEs are going to um, you know, potentially fold over the next months. Um, this will have consequences in terms of actual the ability for people to finance and pay for and feel confident about investment in energy efficiency and the capacity for the industry to actually uh, make it happen. So this is something that policymakers have to work around and, and take on board. Um, the second effect is kind of on bank liquidity. And um, I, mean, I don't know if people have been looking, but um, at the moment, share prices in a lot of the um, kind of banks that lend to smaller businesses and homeowners um, very depressed. Uh, the, the market is anticipating um, foreclosures, uh, bad loans. So the access to finance and the cheapness of finance is likely to be uh, hampered by this. And it makes it even more important that um, banks are able to take a high quality home loans, mortgage for, energy, mortgages for energy efficiency, repackage them into bonds and then issue them onto the debt market. And, and some very good news on this is that um, the Bank of England in the UK, and I know um, some of the other central banks across Europe, have actually found evidence suggesting that uh, green mortgages tend to have a lower uh, probability of default. So you know, it does give us some comfort there. Um, the third issue is, is, is fossil fuel prices. I mean, at the moment, um, as we all know, oil prices have almost halved over the last uh, few weeks, partly through COVID, partly through you know, disputes between OPEC and America and uh, Russia. Uh, but that will have effects on the kind of cost benefit analysis of whether energy efficiency projects are, are going to happen or not or make sense. So this is the kind of climate finance environment around which the calculus of energy efficiency will have to operate. But it makes it even more important that we kind of step in and intervene. And I think in the longer term, um, the industry will have to shift. So I think some of the ideas of um, trying to do stuff off site to try to mass produce things, to make the unit costs lower, to, to, to bulk up the finances into, from, into portfolios of loans and then issue them onto the bond market is becoming even more important. And I, I think you know, big is good, large numbers is good. Um, and this is the question from Paulina, I think, um, earlier on. Do you mind if I just address that very quickly? Absolutely. Um, uh, okay. I mean, the question there was really about, um, if I answered it correctly, uh, what role is there for the EU to benchmark um, some of these kind of ideas. Um, I think, uh, I forget who it was that mentioned this, maybe it was uh, Isadora. Um, the, the EU TEG, the, the technical expert group, has made uh, some really sort of uh, inroads into defining what green looks like. And in the, in the states, in the, in the um, t taxonomy for um, energy efficiency and, and, and um, energy efficient homes, it's really important that um, those kind of ideas of what green enough looks like is, is embodied and used throughout uh, the EU's decision-making process. So I think the EU has got a particular role in kind of setting the benchmark, setting the standards. But then I think fundamentally the actual delivery of the programmes, the operation of the programmes is an incredibly local kind of thing. So, you know, my own kind of um, preference would be for a very kind of bottom-up city level um, aggregation, street by street type things, using the EU as a way of defining what good looks like, and possibly also through things like EIB, accessing cheap finance. Thank you very much, Prashant. And now I would like to turn to Isidoro. Um, Isidoro, there are actually a few questions uh, coming in through the chat for you. Um, but uh, before I jump into those questions, I have one more um, that you touched upon in your presentation. And specifically, uh, you noted the uh, EIBR program um, that combines uh, also the guarantees and the loans. And I would like to better understand um, how uh, this program, if at all, supports the local renovation programs in the existing at one-stop shops. And then um, I'll point you to the other questions from the chat. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so first of, of all, uh, I already mentioned that uh, something that uh, we keep in mind uh, tackling uh, the energy uh, efficient uh, renovation of buildings is to have a, a tailored ap approach. Because uh, of course, there are many different renovations. Uh, some of them are implemented by the individual owners. Some of them are implemented by uh, condominiums or homeowners associations. Uh, so for, just to give you an example, for individual owners, uh, banks and financial institutions, they, they have a long track record and relationship with these clients. They are able to provide, uh, for instance, green mortgages or long-term financing. 
uh, as opposed to the uh, case of uh, housing associations or condominiums, where typically uh, banks are much more uh, reluctant to, to lend directly to, to this uh, promoter. And this is why even if the project is the same uh, from a technical point of view, or it's very similar, uh, these two uh, cases are completely different. Individuals versus condominiums, uh, mortgage-based financing versus uh, uh, equity, uh, basically, investment. Um, uh, so this is something to, to, to keep in mind. And this is why, uh, in our view, it is important to combine uh, risk sharing instruments or financing instruments because they are able to tackle uh, the specificities of the different uh, cases. Um, something that uh, was also uh, discussed is the, is the role of uh, technical assistant of uh, TA and the importance of, of TA. As uh, has been already mentioned, uh, typically energy efficient uh, renovations of buildings um, they are uh, very small scales, and this is why the aggregation of these small investments makes a lot of sense from an economic point of view. But in order to do this, of course, uh, there has to be a preparatory work uh, that uh, can only be supported uh, through technical assistance. I think one of the questions in the chat uh, was referred to the, to the um, technical assistant in the renovation way. Uh, of course, this Please, is Isidoro, which is let me, in the making. But I would... Isidoro, let me read the full question uh, about the technical assistance uh, from uh, Celine uh, from the chat function. Yeah. So Celine mentions that, uh, thank you for describing the technical assistance in any financing scheme. Um, securing sufficient technical assistance looks like a prerequisite to doubling the renovation rate. Yet, last week's EU funding proposals did not yeah. include a dedicating renovation facility and technical assistance seems to be overlooked. Uh, what do we need to do better and to explain how crucial technical assistance is before mm -hmm. adoption of the renovation wave? That's it. The, um, as I was saying, in the context of the renovation wave, of, of course, the, the specific details are still in the making. Uh, but uh, what I would like to say is that we are fully aware of the importance of technical assistance in building renovation projects. And this is something that we are already uh, promoting through Elena. Uh, we are using this technical assistance to promote the preparation of projects, to prepare energy audits, to aggregate these small projects into bigger structure with uh, more economies of scale and even to support financial intermediaries because it is also important to, to develop the, to, to help financial intermediaries to develop their own expertise in the field of uh, energy efficiency. Um, not only Elena, PFRE is another project which is also managed by the, by the IB. It is funded and, uh, by, the, by the European Commission, uh, which uh, all also provides technical assistance for the preparation of energy efficiency projects. So, uh, uh, as I said, we are fully aware of the importance of uh, using tech TA in these cases, also because uh, in some member states, in some countries, uh, energy prices are subsidized, and this, of course, increases the, the payback of some of the energy efficiency measures, and this decreases the at attractiveness, attractiveness of some energy efficiency uh, measures. But um, as I said, uh, there are different options. Uh, we try to, to use uh, as many as possible, and we are fully aware of the importance of uh, properly using this TA to, to, to target uh, energy efficiency renovations. Thanks very much, Isidoro. Um, everybody, just a quick note. We are at uh, 4 o'clock. Um, standard um, European time. However, we will go over just uh, 15 more minutes to address a number of questions that are coming in the chat box right now. Um, so if you have to disconnect, uh, certainly feel free to do so, but uh, I would encourage you to stay for 15 more minutes to address a few important questions. Uh, one question here was coming in addressed to Adrian, whether the numbers in the study that um, he shared were um, covering the UK as well. And Adrian, just uh, let me know that uh, only the countries that were shared on the screen were covered. So the UK is not currently covered by the BPIE's upcoming study. 
Um, now I'd like to ask one more question from Andrew Ross coming in. Uh, what is the role of issuing municipal green bonds by cities as done in the US with municipal bonds? but almost none in the EU and none at all in the UK. What's the problem? So perhaps Prashanta, you can start on that question and I can uh, piggyback on that a bit as well. Sure, I mean, I'm just on the UK. Um, I mean, municipal bonds are available for uh, use in the UK, but uh, a cheaper form of finance for most municipal authorities is prudential borrowing, which allows um, essentially the local authorities to tell um, the de government debt office that they want to borrow and then uh, through the public loans uh, work board, they can just borrow at the same, same cost as the treasury, which is generally a cheaper way of financing for local authority. That's not to say that they can't do municipal bonds. There's nothing to stop them, but it's not necessarily the cheapest way. Um, we, we would very much advocate uh, municipalities using green um, municipal bonds, whether they do it through the debt management office or themselves and using it for retrofits. I wanted to stop them doing that. Um, in the EU, um, I'm aware that, I mean, the, the, the basic issue really is one of aggregation and have they got bonds of the right size. So in Scandinavian countries, there, are, there is quite a lot of bond financing. The cities in, in Scandinavia tend to be quite small. So they tend to work through um, you know, particular uh, banks that are uh, set up really to, to cater for municipal audiences and they'll then aggregate these smaller loans and issue them as bonds. But Christina, please you know, do, 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 do add to this. Thank you very much. No, I'm absolutely on the same page with you. And just a quick addition, uh, just to um, clarify to the majority of our listeners that in the US uh, using municipal bonds to raise funds to then invest those funds in uh, sustainable or energy efficient renewable energy project is a fairly common procedure. So in fact, uh, the PACE mechanism um, has been very much rooted in the idea of municipal bonds, issuing a bond and then funding the project that way. Um, in Europe, that hasn't been uh, the case as Prashant mentioned, but also due to the fact that not every city in Europe has um, a bond rating as well. So it is. it does become quite a complex process from that sense. So public finance just develops slightly different ways in the US and in Europe. And uh, now I'll see if Isidora has any comments to that um, while I'm checking additional um, questions. Uh, um, so I'm also seeing Isidora. Sorry, I was ahead. making uh, yeah, yeah. No, not, uh, I mean, I was going to say that the, probably this is a more general question on the uh, size of the uh, municipal bonds market in, Euros, in Europe versus the, the US, and it's not uh, specifically related to, to uh, energy efficiency uh, matters. Um, the, I mean, typically in, in Europe, the, there is more debt financing and uh, less uh, uh, use of uh, municipal bonds in, in this context. But uh, there are also some fiscal restrictions as far as some are in some uh, member states. And this probably could be another reason to explain why uh, this is not uh, used as widely and as generally as in the US. Thank you very much, Isidoro. Um, a question for Adrian here. Can you elaborate further on the type of jobs that are created through the proposed investment? Are they tied <coughs> to a temporary activity, construction wave, or do they have a certain permanence? So the type of jobs uh, are not specifically uh, compiled in the report because the reports on which they are based didn't necessarily do so as well. Uh, but I can safely say from my deep knowledge and experience of the sector that the type of jobs that we are talking about are local jobs. And that's because buildings are all over Europe in every corner of the, of the continent. They are jobs along the whole value chain. So from the planning stages through design uh, in the manufacturing of products and, uh, and uh, goods and equipment and controls, through to the actual site works, which is what people would normally think of when the works uh, are attached to the building being renovated, on into facility management and maintenance of the buildings later. Uh, so across the board, there are jobs to be created. And the key issue, and it was mentioned initially by Prashant, is that these stimulus programs should not have a really short shelf life. They need to have a sustainable shelf life over time. 
And as in Europe, we've committed to creating a building stock that's highly energy efficient and decarbonized by 2050. And today we have a building stock that's highly inefficient and not decarbonized. This uh, moment in history is the real ideal moment to kickstart a 30 year program of renovation across Europe that will see the, the achievement of our goal and contribute significantly to climate neutrality here in Europe. So it's a kind of a long answer to a short question, but the, the jobs are going to be intellectual jobs. They're going to be manual jobs. And there's one area I've not mentioned. Digitalization is finally hitting the construction sector. And there's a great deal of digital jobs to be had in the renovation of buildings through three-dimensional uh, surveying of existing buildings using drones the capturing of that information in computer systems, transferring that then into what we call mass customization for creating panels or elements of the building that will then in the future uh, lead us to the highly energy efficient buildings uh, that we need. And in saying that uh, and introducing the, the fact of digitalization uh, as a key element moving forward, and Prashant touched on it as well, mass produce, um, there is a large area to explore and to invest in, which is the industrialization of renovation uh, of buildings so that you can bring a lot of the processes indoors, have a higher quality control, uh, greater integration in, in uh, panels that are then fixed to the buildings in a short operation on site, causing less disruption to people uh, in their homes uh, as we move forward. So there's a great deal to do and in one sense, it's a pity that the construction sector has lagged behind in productivity increases in recent years uh, as compared to other sectors, but it means that there's a huge productivity gap that can now be filled if this money is used wisely as we move forward. Indeed, thank you very much for the answer. And uh, there are clearly uh, important changes that are uh, being precipitated by this crisis um, in the construction sector specifically. Um, there's one more question I'd like to pose to the, all of you. Um, and the question is uh, coming from the chat function as well. You mentioned the crucial issue of social impacts of buildings and districts um, and energy efficiency programs. Are you thinking about social impact bonds together with the climate bonds initiative? So I think it's a very interesting question because uh, the idea of social impact has been coming up again and again. And uh, today on this webinar, we didn't quite touch upon the energy poverty element as well. So I just like to open the floor um, to the three of you to jump in. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, as you might appreciate, um, over the last few months, um, there's been a massive growth in other types of labelled bonds other than climate bonds. So um, the, the, the distinctive things about labelled bonds is that there's, when the person borrows money, they, they explain the, how the use of proceeds will be spent. So that's the essence of the, the different type of bond markets. And now, for, for some years now, there's been um, social impact bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds. And, um, as of the last few months, there's been COVID bonds as well. So this is an area that we're certainly exploring quite intensively at the moment. There's a, there's a team of people working on exactly this um, part of. So um, the, the trick is really to decide what are the acceptable use of proceeds. With things like climate bonds, you can sort of point to the Paris Agreement and say, here's a, a particular international accord where there's strict criteria for what's in and what's out. Uh, with social impact, obviously, uh, we need to keep this manageable because in the end, if we look for any kind of scheme that's going to be certified, we've got to make, there's going to be a binary decision of what's in or out. And that, that's, that's the, the challenge in front of us now. What are the thresholds? What are the parameters? Thanks, Prashant. Uh, Adrian Isidoro, any comment on this? Thank you, everybody. Um, yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, we are at 4.11. And uh, I will start uh, wrapping up the webinar. Thank you very much for your participation. I think based on this conversation, um, it's really clear that we need an ambitious green and fair recovery packages to stimulate a massive restructuring in the economy and the society as a response to COVID-19. And uh, based on this conversation, also seeing uh, the numbers so clearly, it's clear that we cannot just give a lifeline 
confined to the existing economy, but we really need to push further and we really need to support the uh, areas that can create massive benefits for European citizens. And as Adrian noted, we need innovation in the construction sector. Um, Isidora spoke to the financing sector that needs uh, ambitious home and building renovation programs that don't just offer financing, but also this technical assistance that is absolutely key chunk and key important element to uh, provide a very people-centric technical assistance to support the home renovation and really the massification of this home renovation. Um, and just in conclusion, I'd like to mention that um, at GNE Finance, uh, we're certainly supporting cities and regions in designing, setting up and managing effective home renovation programs. We work on both the technical assistance side as well as on the financing side. And as this webinar is created under the Europace umbrella that we're partnering with the Climate Bonds Initiative together, um, the Europace project specifically was created to deploy a home renovation program in Spain, and we've done that. And now we're calling for other leader cities across Europe to join us. And uh, this is the time to structure home renovation programs to actually create lasting benefits for European citizens, especially post-COVID recovery. Job creation has been shown is absolutely key element, as well as um, improvements in health, well-being and productivity, and all additional social benefits. So um, I'll just end it with saying that there is no time to waste. Let's act and let's advocate for green and fair recovery. And uh, thank you, everybody. The recording will be available on the Climate Bonds Initiative website and on the Europace website as well. Thank you.